Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar today. I'm Francis Seeley from Globalnet21 and a local group Enfield Voices and this is one of the many webinars today and today we've got Alex Tamboridis with us. He's from the Enfield and Barnet Mine and we're going to talk about some of the work he does and particularly some of the problems that are arising because of social isolation which is a big problem now and will probably get bigger as the years go by. So Alex, welcome to the webinar today. And I'm going to ask you to start with, if you could do it very briefly, is tell us a bit about yourself and your involvement in mental health. Yeah, sure. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, so I, I've been working in mental health for about 20 years. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm working in mental health, and I'll explain what I do in just a second, is because I've, I have my own, as you might say, lived experience of mental health issues myself. When I was younger, um, I had uh, form of forms of depression and a few other bits and bobs, which aren't really worth going into, but suffice to say, that formed much of the, of the personal drive that I have to actually work in mental health. Um, I've mainly worked within the mind network, so in the, in the charity sector. I'm not like a psychiatrist or psychologist or clinician of any kind. Um, I, I started on the front line trying to help people with mental health problems uh, get into and, and stay into employment, but found I was better at sort of uh, managing uh, projects, uh, uh, strategy and so on, and, and making things happen. And, and I guess my current role is, is doing that. And so for the last 10 years or so, I've been working as a chief executive. Uh, um, and, and, and that means you are essentially operationally in charge of a charity and um, you essentially direct, working with the board, all of its activities. Uh, so uh, that's, that's what I do. I have that sort of a managerial uh, and strategic role. Uh, uh, but very much I have a personal driver uh, behind that. Uh, yeah, been working in the local mind network for 20 years or so, worked briefly outside of it in Camden for an organisation called the Brandon Centre, which was focused on young people's mental health. And uh, yeah, actually, I'm beginning to think that this answer is less brief than you wanted. <laughs> well, I, 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 ha I had a feeling it might be, so don't worry. <laughs> you, you were up to my expectations there. You're also a local lad, aren't you? You come from Enfield. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, um, it's strange because my, the, the organisation I, I proudly run is Mind in Enfield and Barnet, and I was born in, in Enfield, uh, raised in Edmonton between the ages of naught to six, and then grew up for the rest of my life in Barnet. So the two areas I'm sort of overlooking uh, uh, in terms of mental health, I was, I grew up in, which is interesting. And, and now, as you say, you're the chief executive of, of Mind in the local area. And, um, you know, I, I can see from your site, you have three, three objectives. And one is campaigning and influencing local authorities and health authority and so on. How do you go about that? And what do you campaign on? I mean, it's just to say, so our ob objectives as a charity are really around improving the mental health of the residents of both of those boroughs. And where people need support for their mental health, we seek to provide it. And where people, and then that's working preventatively to, to increase people's mental well-being, or responding to them at a time of crisis. And we work alongside the NHS and other services to do that. But we can't achieve that aim of improving people's mental health without doing this uh, piece of the, of, of work that you've described as campaigning or what we sometimes call it is influencing. So one way of helping people's mental health is to provide them with services. The other is, is working with people in the local authority, the NHS, other service providers to influence service provision and service design for the better. So we're still helping people with mental health problems, but it's more of an indirect way. So one of the things that we do is that we um, uh, actually, even within our organisation, we have people who have got, like myself, who've got lived experience of mental health issues. We also work with people, uh, 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 obviously, that have, have mental health issues, and we listen to them. 
So we find out what local people with mental health issues want, what's missing uh, in terms of service provision, what their needs are and so on. And then what we do is actually um, uh, make sure that those messages get across to commissioners uh, for the NHS. So com when I say commissioners, I mean people that basically spend money on services. So, and then we also make sure those messages get across to say the local NHS trust as well. And, and the main thing I would say, the main thing I've been, you could say it's a campaign because I have been saying the same thing for about 15 years, um, is, is campaigning for in, increased investment in the social uh, elements of, of services uh, for people with mental health issues. I could say that a bit better. Um, most investment in uh, that goes into the NHS and and from the and uh, yeah from the NHS is geared towards addressing people's mental health in a clinical way. Uh, it, the amount of expenditure uh, uh, that's on that is that goes on medical settings as opposed to uh, what people need in their lives in terms of the community is is vastly skewed. Uh, m most money quite rightly also well a lot of money also goes to responding to people in crisis much less money goes on actually looking at what is happening in the person's life that has caused their mental health to deteriorate is it their uh their sense of connectedness to other people or uh, the negative version of that their, their loneliness is it their financial situation is it problems in their relationship is it uh, problems to do with um, their employment or education. So the th the one the single message that I've been repeating again and again, whether I've been working in West London, North London, East London, or across all of London, or even nationally, is we need to invest more in addressing the social dimensions of people's life. And through that is how we're really going to, yeah. you yeah. know, look at this better. Yeah, well, let, let, let's look at that, because clearly a large part of what you do is delivering services to people who have he mental health needs. And you've talked about it, not in the clinical sense, you talked about it in the, the social sense as well. And, and this problem of, you know, social causes of mental health, like social isolation, for example, these are problems that are not always understood or dealt with, and you're quite right. And in a way, COVID has highlighted them more than ever, hasn't it? It's made them worse. A hundred percent. And it's it's quite interesting, though, this, and also simultaneously frustrating. Uh, during, be between, during lockdown, in the mainstream media, but also in health circles, uh, we were hearing a lot about a concept called health inequalities. Um, and, and also we were hearing a lot about the impact of essentially social restrictions on people's lives and how they, those things relate to mental health. So the fact of the matter is that we've known about these things for a long, long time. <laughs> we've known that isolation impacts like adversely impacts people's mental health for for uh, over a decade or even longer we've also known that your um your your position in society your 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 ethnicity for example your your gender your sexual preference your uh, 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 your age all of these things massively impact how you're affected by by mental health the conversation was brought to life through various different campaigning organisations during lockdown, but the issues aren't new. I mean, why do you think it's taken so long for authorities to understand this social dimension? <laughs> uh, I mean, I have to be cautious about what I say here. Uh, let me start by saying what I think brought it to reality. So there's no doubt that the, the campaigning and activism of Black Lives Matter like bore issues of, of race um, uh, and other connected issues to prompt to the forefront of people's minds, you know, uh, uh, during that period and, and prior to that. 
and and so a lot of conversations were sparked off as as a result of that. Uh, people began to we began to see figures around how certain parts of society were disproportionately affected by COVID, and frankly, they became too painful and too obvious to ignore. Um, but we we have known about. Uh, for example, overrepresentation of young black men in psychiatric settings for many years now. We've known that uh, isolation is, is, you know, is a major causal factor, fact, major causal factor in terms of mental health. We know that poverty is a is a major sort of like correlates with mental health problems in all sorts of different ways. And but your question, because I'm going slightly off the point, is why. Why did it come to prominence just during this period? I mean, one of the only reasons I can think to, to mention, apart from the one I just mentioned in terms of activist groups, is that everybody was starting to become affected by these issues. Whereas before, it was a group of people that were largely disenfranchised in society. And so things like, uh, uh, you know, job instability, being completely isolated, um, uh, uh, an unstable sort of, uh, you know, precarious labour and that sort of thing, we're only really affecting uh, a, a significant but a, but a less vocal part of the population. All of a sudden, in COVID, everyone is becoming isolated. Everyone is worried about their job. Everybody is thinking, what's going on? You know, so I think that, that, that that's my theory, that I guess. I mean yeah, and that's, that's interesting, you know, you only realise the problem when you begin to experience it yourself. And, uh, you know, looking into the future is something that's going to affect us all. And we're all going to experience in one way or the other is the impact of climate change. We know, for example, in Paris in 2018, um, temperatures went so high that lots of people suffered, especially older people, particularly women living alone. Now, do you think this is a problem that is going to really impact on mental health and we're going to have to sort of really prepare for it? I think that the relationship between climate change and mental health is a really interesting one. I, I don't think is explored enough. There's a lot of evidence and interest in the relationship between in, in in the positive relationship between mental health and nature it's it's proven that time spent in nature of one kind or another like trees let's be really specific like being with trees being in in the, in the countryside with grass and so on things like that is proven that, that that is beneficial for your mental health so on the on the one hand there's this acknowledgement that actually we need to acknowledge much more that quite literally nature makes you feel good uh, and it is that simple so there's that acknowledgement uh, to, to, to think about it from the sort of adverse side of things you know what are the adverse consequences of climate change on people's mental health I think the one that I can think of is anxiety there's a I think people's relationship between their own day-to-day -day lives and climate change is, is interesting um, because as I understand it the the position we're in at the moment is nothing short of catastrophic like we haven't seen a threat like this to, to literally the human race for a very long time and yet people are just going on about their daily lives I, I had I had somebody on the uh, I was uh, speaking with a, a receptionist at a GP surgery doing a an asthma check, and she happened to slip into the conversation that my that I, my inhaler was going to be an environmentally friendly one, and she said because we've got to save the planet, you know, and it was the first time I'd heard anyone mention that phrase. I think that um, it is there is a level of anxiety that is going to that is creeping up on us about from climate change and uh, so there is definitely a, a relation between uh, climate change and mental health in that way but there are other uh, more complicated relations between climate change and mental health that 
I, I do think we need to, to look at, um, which are more to do with the amount we consume, why we're consuming the amount we consume, the impacts of that on the environment, uh, and, and how we're spending our time, and a collectiveness or a, a, which started to emerge, strangely enough, in society during lockdown, as opposed to an atomized view of ourselves. And I think that those, those dimensions all correlate both to the environment and mental health. Yeah, well, I, 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 I guess in a way, um, lots of people are aware of um, climate change, but their anxiety comes from the feeling, what can I do? And that creates mental health problems. And for people isolated, especially when they see, you know, high temperatures and they know they're going to suffer, that causes mental health problems as well. So is part of the, the, the solution to that, connecting people, as you say, to nature, but connecting people to each other and connecting to those people who can help create community resilience. Is that a really important thing to do in terms of mental health for the coming few years? I think it's massively important. I think that, I mean, so there's there's uh, something called the five ways to well-being. And the five ways to well-being are basically scientifically evidence ways to improve your mental health. And the, the first one of those five ways to well-being is connect. That is to say that the more you connect with other people, the healthier you will feel mentally in both a way that will bolster your health, but also a recovery. Um, the second thing is be active. So that's about exercise. The third is take notice, which is really try and think about what's going on around you, being in the moment, you know, being being mindful. And for a lot of people, that's about engaging with nature. The fourth thing is learn. So keep learning, challenging yourself. And the last thing is give, which is the, the, the simple fact that acts of altruism are also good for your mental health, uh, as well as them being great for the person you're being altruistic to. They're good for you. So, like basically, the short answer to your question is yes, by people getting together more, reducing their own isolation and sense of being disenfranchised, it is better for their uh, mental health. But I would also argue there's a change of values potentially, which is I, I think that the 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 smaller our units become the more reliant we are on uh, on spending uh, and consumption for happiness. And so I'm drawing a parallel between that sort of almost the isolated atomized unit uh, and massive expenditure through consumerism, which is, goes up, which is out of hand, uh, and mental health. I, I think that a more an approach which is more, more human and brings people together is better for their mental health and better for the environment in that way. But bringing people together in the way you say and, and, and creating the connectivity, creating the networks that do it is a really complex whole society job, isn't it? It's not something that can be done by the statutory agencies alone. You have to bring in the whole of civil society, don't you? Yeah, I think so. Um... And it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. I mean, I, I um, you know, I, I, I grew up in the 80s, uh, started voting in the 90s, you know, and I've been working for most of my um, adult life. Uh, the, 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 the last time I noticed any sense of real community cohesiveness uh, uh, was, was with the... Uh, uh, slightly ill-named clap for carers, you know, like during during that lockdown period, where you had entire streets coming together, you know, in that in that spirit, uh, celebrating the efforts of people that that work in health and social care. Um, but that did that that sort of faded a bit, didn't it? I mean, it literally that that, 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 that faded because it was a sort of. Um temporary thing that we all did to begin with, didn't we? And then it sort of moved away. But yeah. I mean, it's about, I mean, mental health is dependent on developing social and community networks in a way. 
um, you know, building from the bottom up. Does that mean we need to do some sort of social mapping and finding out where people in need are, where people have problems, where people can help? Is it a big job that we all have to do together? It is, yeah. Um, so being quite specific and practical, there are services that people in the, the charity sector, if you like, run called befriending services. And, and what those, and what that is, is where you have a volunteer from the community that wishes, that, that gives up their time to spend a number of hours per week with other people um, with certain needs that, that are isolated. And, and that is a, a befriending relationship. Uh, that relationship is usually sort of hosted or governed, if you like, by a charity which provides the befriender with support um, and also manages to find the, the, the befriendees, if you like. And it, it works well because it, it, you can probably tell it ticks a lot of those five ways to well-being boxes. You know, there's kind of altruism involved, there's social connection, sometimes exercise, learning, and you know, being mindful of the present and what's going on. But it what it does is it provides a consistent uh connection for people that are isolated because this befriending relationship can last, you know, over the over the course of a year or even sometimes longer. And actually what's missing for a lot of people that are isolated with or without mental health problems is that really kind of consistent and sustainable uh, uh, relationship as opposed to people parachuting into your life, trying to solve a problem and then going away again. And it's not really enough, you know, it's not really enough. So, so that sort of befriending approach is really important, but anything we can do to bring people together, you know, uh, giving them sort of peer support, other group activities, or, or we do a lot of activities that are just fun, like art, uh, like exercise, like yoga and things like that, that I guess the primary function of them is to improve people's mental well-being, but also they just bring people together and people want to be together, you know. Uh, but, but it's finding, isn't it, the people who don't normally tap into those services, uh, the people who don't know about it, the people who are alone, they don't uh, understand where they can go. How do we find those? Because those are the people who are going to suffer in, in the future. It needs, doesn't it need a more strategic approach? Because you've got befriending, you've got other things like social prescriptions, for example. But, you know, bringing all these patchworks together to make them work cohesively, that's the big problem we're going to face in the future, isn't it? Yeah, it does. It does require a more strategic approach. Uh, and essentially, it requires data. And, the, and that data does exist, you know. So a lot of people that, because a lot of people that are isolated, as a result of their isolation, their health will deteriorate, or they've, they've isolated because their health has deteriorated, they are in touch with people, their GP. So, so we know, we know um, actually in what I say we, the system knows to a degree who these people are, where they are, what their needs are in terms of their health. But are we asking them when they turn up in their surgeries, and this is not a criticism of, of my you know, GP colleagues at all, are we asking them, are we honing in on what's really going wrong for them in their life? Are, are, are we asking them how connected are they to other people? What support networks do they have? Friends, family, um, what other services are they engaged in? And I'm not sure that question is asked. So these people are statistics that appear in A&E um, uh, from time to time that re repeatedly go back to their, uh, their GPs that sometimes pop up in services here and there. But in the end, like underlying all of that could be the fact that simply they need to connect with other people or that could be a big part of what would help. So we could find, we could find and hopefully support and bring together some of these people. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is a sort of greener practice uh, group of um, GPs in London who are doing exactly the sort of thing you said. They're, they're trying to make the connections that will help people. 
So it's a culture change, but it's happening. But perhaps it's ha not happening fast enough. And is that one of the problems we have that we're always waiting for a crisis to happen yeah. to make the changes? But with something like climate change, you can't wait for that. We've got to do it now. I think that is one of the problems. Um, I'm not quite sure how we solve it. You see, what there's, I think it, that, 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 that you can break the problem you've spotted down into two different uh, ways. So, so one is that people are often literally too busy dealing with the problems of the present to think about the future. Like, so, for, so, um, so that's one problem. Uh, and the other problem is, is that until the, the problem comes and literally stares at you in the face, sometimes you're reluctant to do something about it. Uh, and so I think that in a way, those are the, the two things we need to solve. So, for example, I think Mervyn King, the uh, governor of the Bank of England, said that uh, under uh, austerity or at different points during the most harshest points of it, he was surprised that people hadn't taken to the streets, you know, but... Actually, it's not that surprising because people are too busy feeding themselves. Yeah, they're yeah. too wor busy worrying about how they're going to pay the bills, whether they're going to have their job. No one's got time to, to organise a, a level of sort of uh, 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 the level of essentially social energy that you need to to make these changes. Because but you're, but you're, you're trying to do it locally, though, aren't you? I mean, you, you're in a group, and I'm in that group, but there are others as well, that are trying to look across Enfield um, how we can, you know, tackle some of these problems, how we can preempt what might happen if we don't take the decisions we have to take. And you're taking a leading part in that, aren't you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm lucky in, in my role, and I think in, in Enfield, we're really lucky, actually, in that there is a lot of effort made to ensure that the charity sector or voluntary sector, whatever you want to call it, that the local authority, that the NHS um, actually do have the time to get together and the respect for each other to actually think strategically to address the problems. And there is a um, an initiative uh, that, that we're, we're involved in um, at the moment, which is it's mainly led by a charitable trust with lots of different voluntary sector partners where we are being given the time and space to try and think about some pretty big problems um, and then try and in, in Enfield and try and come up with a systematic way to address them. And it's a, it's brilliant because we're not we don't usually have the opportunity to think strategically. So the um, the group that I am uh, leading on is focused on uh, trying to address mental health and social isolation. And um, we are working through a, uh, uh, or we're working on a, on a model that we hope is gonna make a really big difference in Enfield. Okay, well, I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot more about that in the future, but we've sort of come, come to the end of our 30 minutes already. You wouldn't believe it, it goes, goes so fast. So I'm gonna ask you finally, I mean, if anybody wanted to know more about what you wanted to do or they wanted to help or they wanted to support or they wanted to, 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 to help you do the work that you do, where would they go? How would they make contact? Uh, right, the easiest thing to do is uh, give us a ring. <laughs> Basically, go to our website, which is www.mindeb.org.uk, um, and you can send us an email, uh, you can give us a ring, and volunteer. You know, uh, be part of, of the sort of the, the grassroots social revolution that we're trying to lead, uh, where we are trying to bring more and more people together to make them feel better. Okay, no, that, that, that sounds good. And I, I'm sure lots of people will because the problems we've got in the future are going to be huge. And I know that you understand them and you're doing a great deal to help facilitate bringing those people together 
locally that we need to bring together to make that difference. And I think we all appreciate that. So thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for doing this webinar because you've explained some of the problems very eloquently. And, and for you very briefly too, I must say you, you did very well. <laughs> I, you know, that you always surprised, you did really well. So thanks for doing it, um, Alex, it's been great. And uh, we'll end this webinar now. All right, it's been a, pri a privilege, thank you. Thank you.